following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The end of times. This lecture is going to be related to Saturn, given that today is Saturday, and Saturn, which in Greek is Kronos, is related with time. And uh, the whole explanation will uh, unveil many mysteries that uh, we need to comprehend and understand in order to walk on the path of the realization of our being, our self. To begin, let us read first, but it's written in Revelation, chapter 10, verse 1 to 7. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. This angel is Orifiel, the genie of Saturn, and he had in his hands a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And we had cried, Seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders have uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hands to heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, shall be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. As we read, it says, uh, do not write about this mystery. But uh, today, we will uh, unveil that mystery because we are in the times of the seventh seal. According to prophecy, for instance, Nostradamus, he says, in the year 1999 will come a great king of terror. When people read that, 
we uh, see that they think that they, uh, Nostradamus is related to the year 1999 that already passed. But with the Gnostics, we make the addition because Nostradamus, besides being an astrologer, a seer, and a great prophet, he was Kabbalist. So that year, 1999, makes the addition of 28. And 28 makes the addition of 10. And 10, among the mayor arcana, is a will of Zamzara. The reoccurrent will that comes always cosmically every 25,000 years or 26,000 years in every root race. We are right now at the very end of that 26,000 years in ourselves. And of course, Saturn is uh, the fulfiller of that age, which is the end, times of the end. That you read here, for instance, is written that there should be time no longer. So, according to the seven days of the week, we know that today is the seventh day, called Saturday, related with Saturn. In uh, Hebrew, Shabbatai is Saturn. And from that word Shabbatai comes Shabbat, which is, of course, the seventh day. But Shabbat means also to rest. It's a word that relates to Malkut. Because Malkut is the seventh, counting the days of Genesis, from the beginning, who is, uh, that is Hesed, then Geburah, Tifereth, Gedulah, I mean uh, Geburah, Hesed, Hesed, Geburah, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. Malkut is the seventh. So that's why we see in the word uh, Shabbat, the letters uh, Vav and Tav at the end. That means feminine. Sabbath. We call the Sabbath is the wife of Shabbatai, Saturn. And of course, Saturn is the seventh. Remember that the book of Genesis states that in the seventh day, everything was finished. And God rested. Because that word Shabbat also means to rest. Alchemically, Kabbalistically, it's a very deep meaning of that in order to comprehend. So, the will of Zamzara relates to those seven mysterious seals of the book of Revelation. Nostradamus says, the year 1999 and seven months. Of course, everybody read that literally and said, oh, it's in July. Right? Seven months. Or maybe September, that means seven also. But no. Seven months means seven steps, seven seals. This humanity has opened already six seals of the book of Revelation. And he's just waiting in order to open the last one. That seal relates to the lives of other planets, other humanities. With this, humanity will open the seventh seal and be sure that we are not alone in the cosmos, in the universe. Then the seventh seal will be fulfilled and the end will come. That is interpreting Kabbalistically what Nostradamus says in the year, year 1999, a complete circle of the wheel in seven months. Any alchemist, Kabbalist, can see it very clear. We have not to interpret prophecies literally, because then we fall into mistakes. Everybody now is saying, oh, Nostradamus failed because 1999 passed and nothing happened. 
but the seven months didn't happen yet. Remember that seven months in that prophecy. So this is related, of course, with the seventh, which is Saturn. And uh, Saturn relates to us also, esoterically speaking, because the prophecies should be fulfilled in general with humanity or within us. That depends if we enter into the path. To open the seven seals of the book of Revelation within us relates, of course, with the seven bodies of the true human being, which are physical, vital, astral, mental, causal, beautic, and spiritual. Those are the seven bodies of the true human being that is aware of them. Seven seals. And also, these seven uh, seals relate with uh, uh, the seven chakras, because each body has seven levels. The seven chakras, related, of course, with the seven churches that the book of Revelation talk about. So, Saturn is indeed Kronos, and relates to Binah, the third sephira of the first triangle in the tree of life. Master Samael on Veor states, the victorious adept becomes a son of the serpent and into a serpent that must be swallowed by the eagle of the spirit, which is the third logos, the Holy Spirit. Kronos Saturn is Shiva, the firstborn of creation, the being of our being, the archi Yerophant, archi Magi, the eagle of Anahuac. Greek mythology considers Kronos as one of the oldest gods, a true creator of gods. Saturn Kronos, the rebellious eagle, swallows the snake in order to transform us into gods. In this myth, we find again the transcendental idea that the one who gives life is also the giver of death. Unquestionably, Saturn, with his cycle, easily becomes death with his scythe. If the seed does not die, the plant is not born. If the snake is not swallowed by the Saturnian eagle, we will never be gods. The Gnana or Yana or Gnana or Gnosis is the science of Saturn, that is, the science of the initiatory knowledge, the science of the Enoikion or seer. However, it is necessary to clarify that it is not a single of the previous paragraphs. Have we made an allusion of a certain planetary ruler, Nazareth or Kavir in particular? We just want to specify or specifically refer to the intimate Saturn, the divine Augoides, our individual Logos Bina, the eagle of each one of us. This Saturn, as you see, being, of course, the main point of this lecture, as if we go into Judaism, you know that they worship God every single Saturday. And Saturday is Saturn, which is Shabbatai. And from that word comes Shabbat, which is the, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Shabbatai is Saturn. But Shabbat is a feminine word that goes to Malkut. In other words, Shabbat is the wife of Shabbatai. The other two angles, or the two, uh, we will see the two extremes of one thing. What in Christianity is called the Holy Spirit and Mary. And of course, in mythology, you know the story about Saturn. That he was uh, the youngest boy or son of uh, Gaia, the earth. His father was 
Uranus heaven. But Uranus heaven was uh, impregnating the, uh, Gaia many times and engendering many things among them, uh, his children, but monsters as well. <clears throat> In mythology it states that Gaia went with uh, his young boy, Saturn, and says, listen, I'm sick and tired of getting pregnant with your father. Let us do something here. So then between them, they uh, fabricated a scythe. And he says, when I am with your dad, you come and cut his testicles. According to mythology, he, when he was lying down with Gaia, uh, Saturn came from behind and just cut his testicles. Those fell on the, on the ocean, on the sea. And from that was born Aphrodite. But then Saturn, I mean uh, Uranus, they uh, told to Saturn, the same way that you are taking my power, in the very sneaky way, your power was, is going to be taken by your, one of your children. When Saturn became the king of the universe, of course, right? And his sister, Rhea, another name for the divine mother, an unfoldment, of course, if you see mythologically, cabalistically, you see an unfoldment of forces coming down. Then uh, Saturn says, well, every time that my wife gives birth, I'm going to swallow that son. And no king will come here after me. So then uh, Rhea, the wife of uh, Saturn, had many children. They were, are the gods, of, of course, the gods of the Olympus. But every time the one, one of those gods were being born, he says, come here, give me that child. And he was swallowing it. And then, of course, Rhea says, I have to save one of my sons to the strongest guy because he's just swallowing my children. And instead of uh, giving him a child the last time, he gave him a, a rock, stone, wrapped in cloth. And uh, Saturn swallowed that rock. And he saved Jupiter, Zeus. A beautiful myth, you know. You know, in the painting, you see always Saturn eating a child and masticating it and bleeding. And I was commenting with a friend of mine, I said, that is not accurate. Because if Saturn takes the last child that was uh, Jupiter, that was a stone, he will break his teeth and trying to chew it. He was swallowing it, not chewing them. And that's the story of, of Saturn. And then when Jupiter, Zeus, came, was grown, came and uh, uh, fight against uh, Saturn and the Titans. And, and Jupiter defeated him. Of course, his uh, mother gave to Saturn a special beverage. I don't remember the what plant, but that made him to vomit. And when he vomited, all the gods that he swallowed before were coming out. Neptune, you know, Hades, and all of those that you find in the Olympus. And this is how Saturn was defeated. And all of this, of course, is a mystery. Because he is the father of the gods, as you see there. But Saturn, as the Master Samael says, is Bina, the Holy Spirit. Which in this day and age, of course, uh, humanity is using it in the wrong way. Because the uh, Holy Spirit be nigh the sexual force, the force of Saturn. That's why, uh, uh, sexually speaking, uh, Sabbath, the, the Shabbat is uh, very sacred in order for those that follow the path of the Judaism to perform the sexual act in the Friday night. Because it's already Saturday. So obviously, uh, Saturn is uh, the Holy Spirit, Bina. And that's why uh, we gave uh, lectures on Saturday as well. Remember that uh, in Rome, they were celebrating Saturnalia. 
when? In the sign of Capricorn. We are right now in the sign of Capricorn, because in Capricorn falls winter, which is ruled by Saturn. In the Greek Saturnalias, were transformed with Christianity into Christmas, or the festivity of the lights. The lights that in Judaism is called Hanukkah, or Enoikon, as the master, uh, Enoikon or Enoichon, the seer. You know, in order to be a seer, you have to have light. And of course, the festival of lights, Saturnalia and Christmas is the same. We celebrate the lights. What the lights? The lights of the seven logos, of course. The seven the stars that are in heaven. And this is precisely what we have to, to understand when entering into these mysteries of, of Saturn. The elder of days, it's called in Kabbalah, right? This Enoikon, or Enoch, in other words, it's called Hanuk in Judaism or in Hebrew. And from that Hanuk comes Hanukkah, or the festival of the lights, which is celebrated around the same time uh, when the, the Saturnalia comes. And everything is, you know, is, is, is hidden with a veil of mystery in order for us to understand that that is in relation with the development that we have to have in order to celebrate the end of times. In us, initiatically speaking. Now let us talk about Quetzalcoatl. It says, unquestionably, the snake devoured by the eagle becomes, in fact, and by its own right, into the feathered serpent. If instead of uh, saying feathered serpent, we said flaming serpent, it's the same. It's a synonym. You see that the feathered serpent, I call the, the natives from America, and all those uh, from Mexico and South America, and even here in the north of the United States and Canada, they have the custom of adorning themselves with feathers from the top of the head back through the spine. And it's because the feather is the symbol of a bird, like the Holy Spirit, the white dove, or the eagle, also symbol of the bird that flies, the air. But also of fire. Because if you use your imagination, you will see that the feathers are, uh, resemble flames coming into those that develop the Kundalini. So those flames, of course, are the feathers and uh, as the ancient symbolized, the medulla from where that fire rises and develops that fire of feathers is the serpent. That is also called the snail, which is protected by the shells, which are the 23 vertebra of our spinal column. So that snail goes there, and that's why Mexicans or the secret of Anahua says that Quetzalcoatl was protected or have many houses of snail houses. Then you understand why they're talking about the spinal column. The medulla, which is the central middle path where the serpent, the fire rises, is protected by the shells or by the vertebrae. And the feathers, of course, is a fire. So the feather serpent is a symbol of the mixture of the serpent with the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Ghost. It initiate that first is swallowed by the serpent and then is swallowed by the eagle. The same thing, the same myth that we were talking about, about Saturn swallowing his own children. Remember that he was swallowing gods. Don't be afraid because we are not gods. In the, one of the uh, axioms of Gnosticism, he said, Saturn, Bina, the Holy Spirit, he doesn't eat filth. He doesn't eat rubbish. 
garbage. Right? He only eats holy things. And we are not holy. But the goal of any initiative is to become a feathered serpent. But for that, you have to annihilate all the filthiness that we have within. Because the serpent doesn't need anything filthy. And that's precisely the point here in the esoteric meaning of Saturn, which is the same feathered serpent, is a union of the forces of Bina. And, uh, well, the Master Samuel Ombeor in the secret doctrine of Hanawak states that. He says, the connection of the Lingam Yoni without the ejaculation of the end seminis is certainly the specific key by which Adam and Eve can awaken the serpent of Saturn in their esoteric anatomy. What is this serpent of Saturn? Remember that Adam and Eve fell in Saturday. If you read the second chapter of the book of Genesis, you will see that in Saturday, in the seventh day, is when Bina, Saturn, Jehovah Elohim, said to Adam, do not eat of this tree, otherwise you will die. It wasn't Saturn. Because you had to know, had to obey the superior laws in order to develop that serpentine serpent. I mean, Saturnian serpent. The Saturnian serpent does not eat anything filthy. Rhea, the divine wife of Cronos, can only devour psychic and spiritual principles, glorious bodies, forces, powers, etc. In the name of the truth, we must make the following enunciation. Without any specific particular exception, no initiate, nor even those which in the Western esoteric tradition reach the level of adeptus exemptus, could enjoy the powers of the snake without having previously devoured by it. It is not enough to achieve the ascent of the igneous serpent of our magical powers along the spinal column from chakra to chakra. We will say from shell to shell like a snail. It is urgent, undelayable, unpostponable, to be devoured by the snake, only thus will become something distinct. We will become something distinct, different. So, of course, this is precisely the point here in these teachings. We teach how to awake the Kundalini. But uh, some of us, with have many years in this doctrine, do not understand because they say, well, I'm practicing uh, this awakening of this sexual force in my spinal column, but still I don't see any development. In other words, they are saying they don't see any results, magical forces, etc. But they have to understand that in order to enjoy that, we have to die. When we say that we have to die, we're talking about the death of our defects, vices, and errors, our inhuman elements that we call animal elements that we have, like lust, anger, pride, envy, vanity, laziness, gluttony, etc. Because that's precisely the, the positive aspect of this matter. To develop the Kundalini as we are, with all of those defects and vices, and then the Holy Spirit will transform us into immortal demons. Because all of those defects that we already described are attributes of demons, of animals. It would be absurd that the Holy Spirit will swallow us and transform us into immortal demons. That's, that, that doesn't happen. Only the gods are immortal. And in order to become a god, we have to annihilate what we have of demon. And I don't need to describe to you what is that, because we have a lot of that. See here in this graphic, the tree of life that we were talking about, divided in three triangles. Each triangle relates to the four worlds of Kabbalah. 
which we have to experience by developing the serpent, the fire. Remember that Jesus said, be wise as serpents and meek as doves. This is what Jesus said. And in that teaching, to be wise as serpent is to develop that serpentine fire on our back and meek like doves, meaning with the power of the Holy Spirit that in our language is called Quetzalcoatl, and in Mayan language is called Kukulkan. So see the four worlds of Kabbalah, Atziluth, Bria, Yatsira, and Asia. And in each world, you find the ten sephiroths. This is how we understand Kabbalah, in order not to fall into mistakes. Now, of course, here in the left, we see the world of Klippoth, hell, which is uh, uh, the inverted tree of life. That's why it's called the tree of death. And uh, we don't want to fall into Klippoth. We want to rise into different worlds of Kabbalah in order to reach the top, which is the abstract, absolute space. All of us have part of those four worlds. Of Asiluth, we have all of those archetypes, which are elements that we have to develop in our psyche. They are not developed, but we can do it. That's what we have for Asiluth. From Bria, we have the power, of course, of creation, which is in our sexual organs. And formation, Yetzira, is also related with the sexual force. We are going to study that in order to understand what is the time that we have to be aware of. And of course, Asia is a physical world that many translators mistake with the continent of Asia. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, we read, And on the Shevi day, Elohim finished his work which he had made, and he Shabbat, that is, rested. On the Shevi which means seventh. From all of his work which he had made, and Elohim gave his blessing to the, to the Shevi'i day and made it holy, because on that day the Shabbat rested from all the works which he had created and made. We have here a graphic of Saturnalia, or Christmas if you want, and uh, you see how the seventh is written, Shebi'i, and Shabbat, which means rest, is also written with the same words, the same letters. And uh, what these verses of Genesis are saying, that Elohim, who is the name of Binah, Saturn, the Holy Spirit, rested on Malkut, which is the Shabbat, in order to do all the work that he made. And this is precisely what in mythology, in the Saturnalia, the so-called pagans were celebrating. But those celebrations are still in Christianity, even if we think that we are not pagans. But we have a lot of paganism because paganism is really related with mythology that, is, that they have the same values that we are studying here. That's why with the Gnostic, we love all religions. And even if the people call us pagans, we don't care because we know what we are doing. It's not fanaticism, but behold there in the center of that graphic, you see Saturn with his scythe, the father of the gods. Jupiter is called the father of the gods, but really the father of Jupiter was Saturn. And he is the one that creates. 
So Saturn rested on Shabbat, meaning in physical terms, that the man has to rest on his woman in the sexual act in order to create. And that's so obvious. Because in the physical world, if a man wants a child, has to rest on the woman. Why rest on the woman? Well, she is the one that made it, makes the, the boy or the child in nine months. She's the one that makes it. But he needs the seed. Or she needs, I mean, the seed. And that seed is given by her husband. So in this case, Malkut, which is a female aspect called Shabbat, receives Shabbatai, Saturn, the forces of creation, in order to create. And that's why it says that Elohim, Binah, rested on the Shabbat, on the woman, in order to create. As below, so above. And above, so below. Nobody can create by being a single. If you want to create, you have to work in yourselves. And that's why the sexual force is the secret of the initiation. But the more powerful force is between men and women. And this is how you, uh, when you study the Shabbat, celebrating the Sabbath, then you comprehend this. And in order to comprehend more deeply about the tree of life, which are the ten sephiroth, we have to learn how to place those sephiroth in our three brains. Because remember that we always say we have three brains. And the path of the initiation is through the three brains. We said Yesod is the first brain, which is a sexual, instinctual motor energy. Then Tifereth is the second brain, counting the brains you know, from the bottom to the top, what we call the emotional center, the emotional brain, and the head, which is called that, the third chamber. We're now here, or oh, I'm taking this knowledge from the third chamber. That third chamber is my head, which is related with the first triangle. Keterho ma bina in my head. But I understand that this first triangle relates with my three brains. In the, as you see it there, Keter is in my head, Chochma is in my heart, and Bina is in my sex. By seeing like that, we understand what we're reading. In Christianity, it says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then they rise, the force of the Holy Spirit, and make a cross is this. Like that, right? Oh, you can leave it here, it doesn't matter. It's over the forces of creative forces of the kidneys going up in order to make the cross. So you have to visualize always that. You see, the, the three brains, you said, well, my three brains are related with Yesod, Tifereth, and that. Because that synthesizes. The first triangle, here. That is knowledge, it's in the throat. I am teaching you from my throat. But this throat is nursed by my head. And of course, receive also strength from my heart and from my sex. Based on that, an experience is how we teach. And that's why you see that the second triangle of the tree of life Relates in the same way. You put Tifereth in the sex, Geburah in the heart, and Hesed in the head. And then you understand why the third triangle relates to the three primary forces. That's why Tifereth is the one that receives the sixth commandment. You shall not eat from that fruit. Because when he descends to Yesod, which means Eden, that's Tifereth in Eden. And this is how we understand that the forces of the head relates to the Trinity. But the one that is always manifest in that Trinity 
in the human kingdom is the Holy Spirit, Bina, Saturn, Kronos, time. So you see there, for instance, <coughs> that the bottom of uh, the third triangle relates to Yesod, Hod, and Exach. You always have to place those triangles in your three brains in order to understand the doctrine, in order to understand what you're reading. For instance, Master Samael on the earth states, Bina, the Holy Spirit, is Mercury. And you say, how is Mercury? Yeah, because Netza relates to the mind, and Netza is Hermes, the mind, Mercury. And is ruled by Bina. And Hod, which is in relation with the emotional center, is in relation with the heart. Inferior forces, of course, because the Higers are in Tifereth. And you find that Geburah is also like that, in the heart. So study Kabbalah in that way with your three brains and place those three triangles in your three brains and you will see how easily you will understand what the Master uh, explains. For instance, he says, Christ is always the son of the Divine Mother Kundalini. She is always conceived her son through the work and grace of Saturn, the third Logos. She is always virginal before the birth, during the birth, and after the birth. Among the Egyptians, the virgin is Isis. Among the Hindus, Kali, in her positive aspect. Among the Aztecs, Tonantzin. She is Rhea, Sibele, Maria, Adonia, Insoberta, etc. Many names. That's the female aspect of the Holy Spirit. And she is the one that is giving always the children to Saturn, for Saturn to swallow them. The goal of any initiate is to be swallowed by Saturn. But in order to be swallowed by Saturn, you have to be born from Rhea. And who is Rhea? The Divine Mother inside. The Kundalini, in other words, the serpent. To have the right to be swallowed by Saturn is, is a very higher level. Because when Saturn and vomited you after eating you or swallowing you, you become a god, a feathered serpent. That's precisely the meaning of this mystery that we are talking about. Now, you see this circle here, this sephira? That, as I was saying, is precisely here, beneath the head. And the head is always represented by Keter, which means the crown. Chochma, Bina, which are the two hemispheres of our brain. And from those three forces, the Holy Trinity, comes the knowledge here in the throat. That. Now, it is important to know what that is. That, the sephira of Hebrew mystery, is produced by the esoteric conjunction of Shiva Shakti, Osiris Isis, perpetually united in Yesod, the foundation, the night sephira, the night sphere sex. But hidden by the mystery of that, which has the tantric knowledge, which is processed with the Saha Maituna, or sexual magic, that when correctly utilized, permits the intimate realization of the being. It is necessary that all of us profoundly reflect that we deeply comprehend all of this. He and she are united in the cubic stone of Yesod, which is sex. The perfect tantric knowledge is the outcome of the union of he and she with which we can internally self-realize ourselves in all the levels of the being. So, the mystery that we're talking about here, which is in the throat, knowledge, because in order to express knowledge, we have to talk. That. But as we saw before, the two forces, he and she, are divided. 
She is below and he is above the man and the woman. The two forces. That's why they said that they are perpetually united in Yesod. Yesod is precisely the nice sphere. Yesod is, is here, as you see. That is in the throat, and Yesod is in the, in the sexual organs. In other words, when it's stated that we, they are perpetually united, mean in the initiate that knows the path, he has to unite sexually with his wife, or his wife with his husband, her husband, I mean, in order to perform the mystery of that, because that mystery is directly related to the stone of Yesod. And we are going to see how. Some Kabbalist authors suppose that that, the sephirah that gives knowledge or sapience, comes from the fusion of the masculine cosmic Christ, Chokhmah, with Bina, and assume that Bina is exclusively feminine. Such an affirmation is clearly false because the Holy Spirit is really masculine, and when he unfolds himself into the Divine Mother, the perfect couple is formed as we call the white dove with Mary. Mary itself represents Malkut, our physicality, and the Holy Spirit is above. All us in this day and age, according to tradition, and that is very vulgarized, the so famous Santa Claus, which is coming from Saturn. His vesture is red, which means fire. White, purity, and black, because enters into the matter. That's the meaning of the, of the so famous Santa Claus. As I said, some people don't believe in Santa Claus because they don't know that they are referring to the sexual force. Simple as that. And that's why he comes and gives gifts to children. Until you be children, like children, you will enter into the kingdom of heaven, is what Jesus says. But... We have to become like children in order to be swallowed by Saturn or by, this, by, the, by the eagle, right? And you see the mystery there. This is the two polarities of Bina, which are in that. But we have to take into account that even while she, the Divine Mother, is the spouse of the third Logos, the Holy Spirit within the third Logos is the second Logos and also the first Logos, because in the end, the Logos is the undividable, unitotal, and integral triune. A lot of subtleness is needed in order to understand this, a lot of refinement, synthetism, and intuition. If the Bina, the Holy Spirit, within it is Chokhmah and Keter, this is what is called the Holy Trinity, meaning one or three in one. So if Bina is divided in two, which is the Divine Mother, the feminine aspect, obviously the two of them have the Trinity within themselves. But that division occurs here. In that, in the throat. And behold this, the throat is feminine. The throat is a uterus where the word is gestated. It forms here in the throat. But we need a masculine force in order to do it. So the Holy Spirit is masculine and feminine at the same time. In the cubic stone of Yasod, in the ninth sphere, tantric knowledge, the tantric initiation comes. The development of the serpent along the dorsal spine is possible by means of the tantras. Okay, so 
Let us see about this cubic stone of Yesod, which is related with that. As you see, that is in the throat. But look, it's exactly where the medulla joins with the brain. And the brain is related with the three primary forces, Keter, Homavi, Now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is how we had to visualize that. So the Saturnian serpent does not eat anything filthy. So we had to develop that, and in order for that, we had to clean our mind, our brain, of all impurities. This is how you see, and it's stated, that the central nervous system, which is shown there in that graphic, is the throne of God, the throne of the Father. And we understand that the brain contains the three primary forces. And the son of the three primary forces is called Keter, our inner most, that utilizes the central nervous system as his throne. By studying the three brains in the tree of uh, life, then we understand why the innermost is related with the spinal column in the brain, as well as the three logoi, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is how we have to see our Father, our God. So when you walk, remember that your central nervous system is the throne of God. Is God seated there? Or who is seated? Your mind? Your sinful mind? That's why it, say, it says that the devil is taking the, the seat of God in ourselves. Instead of God sitting there, is the devil, meaning Satan, that personify in this case anger, pride, vanity, laziness, gluttony, lust. So, let us go deep into this and uh, read what the Master Samaelon VR stated. <coughs> the cubic stones of your soul situated in the creative organs is certainly that metallic soul which is the outcome of sexual transmutations. We can call this metallic soul the mercury of secret philosophy, or when speaking with simpler language, creative energy. This energy in itself is allegorized or symbolized by the devil. You see there? You are afraid of the devil? That means that you are afraid of yourself. Because there are as many devils on the earth as many people. Everyone carries his own devil, egotistically speaking, but according to forces. How do you say devil in Hebrew? Shaddai. This is how you say it. If you put these three letters, Hebrew letters, in the internet, from Hebrew to English, what is Shaddai? You will say devil, demon, goblin, and all those negative things that people think negative. Yeah. And that name, Shaddai, is written in the front door of any house of Judaism. Before entering, they kiss that sign. And if, when they go, oh, they leave also. Because it's Yesod. The entrance of any house is a sexual organ. When Adam knew Eve, you see that knowledge, he entered through the doors of sex into Eve. And through the doors of sex, Eve knew Adam. They knew each other. And they discovered that they were naked. So obviously, the devil made them to unite sexually. Shaddai. 
But if you whitewash your devil and transform it into Lucifer, and it is no longer Shaddai, but El Shaddai. El means God. El Shaddai is precisely the entity that we want to develop, not Shaddai. Because everybody has Shaddai. And enjoying their Shaddai in this day and age, because it's uh, sexual freedom, adultery, fornication, prostitution, homosexuality, etc. All of them are Shadi or Shadim, we will say, which is plural. But El Shaddai, only those that transmute their sexual energy that are chaste, develop El Shaddai. They said, the master, when we say that we must work with the devil, Shaddai, this is in order to transform it into Hillel El Shaddai. This word Hillel is uh, translated in, in uh, Isaiah as Lucifer. But Lucifer is different. His name is Light Carrier. If we want to carry the light of our sexual force of the Holy Spirit, we have to be Hillel El Shaddai. Then the Master said, we are clearly referring to the labor in the great work. It becomes interesting that precisely here in the cubic stone of Yesod is where Shiva and Shakti, Osiris, Isis are sexually united. And here is precisely where the tantric knowledge is found. The attainment of the intimate realization of the being is not possible without it. Without Shaddai. And remember this. That Shaddai came sneakily in the seventh day. In the Saturn day. In Shabbatai. To initiate. Because in the beginning you have to confront your own devil in order to enter into initiation. It's not that you want to confront somebody else. It's you. It's called the guardian of the threshold. That threshold, that gate, is precisely sex. If you defeat that guardian, it means that you want to walk on the path. And then you enter into the path. But who opens the door for you? The devil. The devil has the keys. But that devil is not outside. It's within you. And it's a sexual force. It's a best friend. If we take advantage. He tempts us. If we defeat him, we make light. Lucy there. One is to descend to the ninth sphere, which was, has two representations. Talking about Yesod here. The first representation is the cubic stone of Yesod. We had to know how to transmute the sexual energy because initiation starts there. Everybody talks about initiation and to be a great initial, but if you are fornicating, if you are ejaculating the ends seminis, you are not an initial. You're just wasting your time. Because after that, after you work with that in chastity, you have to confront your own demons, your own devils, your own defects, errors, vices. And that's the second aspect. The nine circles, the atomic infernos, or what in this day is called the Enneagram, in Yatsira, where the initial must descend. What is this Enneagram? Well, are the nine spheres above Malkut related with the world of formation? Because you, you had to be formed in the second day of Genesis, I mean, in the second chapter of Genesis, which is the seventh day, which is stated. And Jehovah Elohim formed, that world formed is Yetzira. Adam, from the dust of the earth. And Adam became a living soul. That formation 
takes nine steps in the world of Yetzirah. This is precisely the nine circles, different times. Let me go into this in order to comprehend this. Because in the Bible, you read that in the time of the end, before that comes, the saints will be selected. The saints will be selected. And after time and times, and a half of a time, the end will come. We read that in Daniel. We read that also in the book of Revelation. When the writer says that everything will be fulfilled at the time, times, and a half of a time. And we read that, okay, we're talking about Saturn here, which is Kronos. The Holy Spirit, initiatically speaking. What is time? Time, in order to understand that, we have to go into the Bible. In the Bible, we read in the first chapter, verse 14. And Elohim said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for times and for days and years. That's the fourth day. What is the firmament of heaven? I mean, the top of the head, right? But when we talk about the firmament, it's the spinal medulla. Because in the second day is written, let us make a firmament between the superior waters and the inferior waters, right? The superior waters are the cerebral spinal fluids, and the inferior waters are the sexual semen waters, the inferior. So between the inferior and the superior, we have the medulla. That's the firmament that we have to create. But that firmament is created when that serpent, that light, rises in the spinal column. And then, in the fourth day, it says, let there be lights in the firmament. What firmament? The firmament that we have already awakened there. Those lights, of course, are superior forces that we had to develop in the four initiation of major mysteries that will, that will be give you signs. For instance, they said that the moon is a lesser light, and the sun is the superior light, right? This is how with this four day of Genesis states. It's talking about the creation of the two forces, the sun above and the moon below. Yesod is ruled by the moon, and Tiferet is ruled by the sun, your heart. Tiferet, your heart, you saw your sex. A firmament. The stars are above in your head. But listen there, this word. Meod. Meodim. This is how I've written. And for times, times is meod. In Hebrew, it says, how are you? They said, tov meod, meaning my times are good. What I am experiencing now in this moment is good, meod. But meod is always related with festivals, holidays, seasons. It's a time, you know, times, in order to measure initiations. That's why the Shabbat, for instance, is Meod, a festival. But there are many festivals in Judaism, as in Paganism, and all that are festivals, Meods, that we have to understand and comprehend. 
And those meods are related with Saturn, because time is Saturn, it's Kronos, talking about the initiations inside. And that's why in the book of Daniel it is written, And I hear the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half of a time. And then the book of Revelation, which is written in Greek, says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Remember that eagle. What is that eagle? That she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half of a time. From the face of the serpent. And the Master Samael on the or before dying, he wrote in Pity Sophia. He just unveiled the half of that book. He said, We, Samael on the or, tell ye in the name of the first mystery of Pity Sophia and the Savior of the world that I will unveil the remaining part of the Gnostic Bible in the half of the half of the time. Mysterious words, cryptic words, that when you read this, what is this? If you are serious students of Kabbalah and alchemy, you know what you're reading. But people read that and it says, and they describe or interpret that in their own way. Saturn, Bina, Kronos is the Lord of Time, the one that pushes the, the, the steps and the rules, as you see in creation. We always talk about three mountains. The first mountain is the mountain of initiation. That is time. And when you have to work with your sexual forces, right? You have to create. You have to be born again, as the Christianity says. In order to be born again, you need time. When you said that you need time, I need, you need Saturn, you need Kronos and Rhea, because between them, which are united in Yesod, they will create within you the actual body, the mental body, the causal body. And that's the time. And if you take the direct path to your self-realization, and then the Lord Christ descends into you, thanks to Saturn and Rhea. Because the Christ that is being born within you is son of the Holy Spirit, the white dove, and Mary. That is the Savior. So the Holy Spirit has to bring you down, you see. You saw with Saturn there in the middle. That's time. And when the Lord descends in you, you developed the serpents of light. The serpents of light are the initiations of Venus, of love, higher aspects of initiation. That's called the first mountain. So in the first mountain is time, and that time is serpents of fire, serpents of light. But when you reach the end or the top, the summit of that mountain of initiation, times up into you. Because you enter into the world of Yetzirah, where there is different times in each sephirah of the world of formation. You have to form yourself. Saturn had to swallow, kill you in different levels. That's called the aspect of the Enneagram. Different times. Matthew Samael uh, described those times in the second mountain in his book, The Three Mountains. Different times. And when you gain access to the heaven of the moon, to the heaven of Mercury, to the heaven of Venus, to the heaven of Mars, to the heaven of the sun, to the heaven of Jupiter, to the heaven of Saturn, you see seven heavens. And you go beyond because there are nine heavens 
in the world of Yetzirah that we have to develop. And this is called times, esoterically speaking. So when you develop time and times, oh, you are ready. For what? For the half of a time. What is the half of a time? If time is the first mountain of initiation, the half of that mountain is the half of a time. Right? Because the third aspect of this transformation that we are realizing or performing is to qualify the initiations of light, or what we call the Venustic initiations. And that qualification relates to Saturn. And that eight years of transformation, the serpent swallows you. Every single body of you is swallowed. And when she finishes her fist with you, because you are already pure, clean, then the eagle comes, Saturn, and swallows the serpent. And then you are, after that, a feathered serpent. So the half of a time relates to the qualifications of the initiations of light. It's easy to see. Time, times, and a half of a time. The culmination, what we call, of resurrection. Esoterically speaking, of course, you can read many books in order to uh, feed this knowledge more, because I'm talking in synthesis here, in order to us to comprehend the path that we are uh, experiencing here. So Yesod is, of course, what we call the first chamber, because it's in relation with the ninth sephira of the tree of life. When one is single, one enters into the nine layers of the earth, because the nine layers of the earth relate to Yasad. You want to know how evil you are? You want to know what is those elements that you have to fight against? How do I see this? Well, you have to enter into the probationary path, which are the nine initiations of your mysteries, in which the initiate penetrates in his own subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness, and face one after the other until reaching the center of the earth. This dissension, or descent, I mean, is not physical. That's why we show there uh, the entrance, for instance, when, when Orpheus wants to look for Eurydice, his wife, that was killed by a serpent, by the way. He goes into hell. He says, please. He faced the, the guardian there. He says, please, open the door for me. I want to gain my soul. I lost it. He talks with, with Hades or Pluto in order to enter into the underworld. That entrance into the nine layers is precisely what we call the nine initiations of minor mysteries to know what we have to fight against in order to gain our soul. But in the higher aspect is the Enneagram. When you literally go down again into those uh, nine layers and disintegrate your defects and vices in order to gain access to heaven. The liar of Orpheus it's a symbol of the spinal column, of course. It has seven notes there. You play 
with the work on the ninth sphere in your spinal column is how you enter into hell. And as the master says, this is uh, the great uh, uh, ordeal for the supreme dignity of any hierophant, Hermes, or Orpheus, Buddha, Jesus Christ, or Aster, Dante, and many other great initials had to pass this maximum ordeal, the descent into the ninth sphere, beginning with limbo and going down, 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 until reaching the center. In the past, when the initial was doing that, it was awakening his, his consciousness or her consciousness, and he was reaching the ninth sphere, then the master was calling him and said, okay, now you walk, now you know against what you have to fight. We are now in the center here. Do you see there? Dante asked uh, to his uh, master, Virgilius, is Lucifer? Yeah, it's Lucifer. That Lucifer is Shaddai. You have to climb on the ribs of Lucifer in order to go. That means you have to perform the sexual act. You have to marry. You are being in celibacy for many years. Now you have to marry. If you don't perform the sexual act, how are you going to defeat Lucifer? Lucifer is defeated in his own field. And the field of Lucifer is sex. You have to be chaste. Go into the nice sphere, but don't eat the fruit. That's a mystery. But everybody that goes into the nice sphere, they eat the fruit. And not only one fruit, but they swallow the whole apple tree. <laughs> and that's precisely the problem. So, remember, that's the first And you have to face, of course, the mysteries of the first chamber in order to enter into the second chamber, which is Tifereth. What is Tifereth? Tifereth is essentially the region of, of religious mysticism is in the causal world or world of the conscious will. The Gnostic who learns how to combine meditation with prayer can unquestionably make objective and cognizant contact with the gods of nature. The causal world is the sphere of the masters, is the eternal temple in heaven that some hand has built. It is the greatest abode of the esoteric fraternity. The rabbinical Hebrew Kabbalists know that the mantra of the causal world has been is and always will be Eloah va that. Meditating on those words is equivalent to knocking on the doors of the marvelous great temple. So the heart relates with Tifereth. That's why those people that pronounce against rituals are crazy. The causal world, if it relates to the heart. And in the lower levels, it's hard. Without the fires of the heart, nobody advances to mastery. To pronounce yourself against rituals is to pronounce against the heart, the fires of the heart. And remember that it's stated that in order for the serpent to rise in your spinal column, it does it by the merits of your heart. If you don't have good merits, that serpent doesn't go up. It's not mechanical, automatic, like many people think. That just by doing this exercise, the Kundalini is going to go to the head. No. It goes very slow. If you commit mistakes with your heart, and one of those mistakes in this day and age is among the Gnostics that pronounce themselves against the second chamber, against Tifereth, against Hod or any of the three chambers that you see there, according to the Tree of Life. Once you enter into this path, you have to follow the three chambers. That's what we always say. 
But understand that these three chambers are in you. Study the tree of life and see the three chambers in the middle. Yasad is the door, the open, when you have to confront Shaddai, the devil, which is within you. Then you enter into the second chamber, which is the heart. And then to enter there, of course, you have to fight a lot. But the lower level of the second chamber is Hod. And when you feed your heart with the rituals, the forces of the Eucharist, in order to keep ahead, because in every triangle, you find always the three brains. And that is always synthesized in the third factor. In order to teach, in order to give knowledge, you have to do it through your mouth, through your dot, through your throat. And you have to walk on the, th on the, three, ch on the three chambers. People are, that are very preoccupied with being in the chambers in the physical world. It doesn't matter if somebody enters into the third chamber in the, in, in the physical world, if that person is not in the third chamber, internally speaking, individually speaking. Because that is that third chamber that unites the three primary forces, the Holy Trinity. And by teaching, by sacrificing yourself for humanity, is how you uh, see that. The three chambers. Of course, to belong to the three chambers here in the physical world is good. But it's better to belong internally, individually speaking, with you, in order for you to see how the middle path is related with the three chambers. If you exclude any chamber from the middle path, then you are not walking in the middle path. You're walking in the path that you know what is. See what Jesus says, for instance, in the book of Acts after resurrection. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time uh, restore the, again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times. You see? Meodim. Meod is time. Meodim is times. All the seasons which the Father, Kronos, Saturn, Binah, Jehovah Elohim, had put in his own power. You want to know the times? You have to work on yourself, and then you know the times. And decipher the times with humanity too. Because humanity will fulfill the times too, but mechanically. And we read in the Gnostic uh, doctrine, because you are my nation, my nation is made up of those capable of awakening and rising inside each one the rhythm of their idiosyncrasy. Let the laws be fulfilled and let this be within the ritual of beauty and good. These are the rituals of the elements. Earth, water, air, and fire. Those are the elements. The ordeals that we have to receive. And the festival. Again, meodim, plural, of the temples. Those times are related with the temples. Remember, it's written that when you overcome some ordeals or you receive certain initiations, you are receiving the temples with festivities. Those festivities are called meodim. If it's just one festivity, it's meod. And this is what uh, Daniel says, meod, meodim, and the half of a meod. Time, times, and a half of a time. This is how we have to understand that. And when the Master Samael, Samael on verse says, I will unveil the rest of Pity Sophia at the half of the half of the time, what is that? What is the time? The first mountain. What is the half of that time? The serpents of fire. And what is the half of that half? It's Tifereth. Meaning that if you reach Tifereth, which is the half of the half of the time, and you 
take the direct path, you will receive Christ. Incarnation. And then the rest of the Gnostic Bible will be unveiled within you. Not outside of you. Because when people read what is unveiled in the piece of Sophia, and they start reading it, they say, oh my God, what is this? I don't understand. Too much Kabbalah. Right? If they don't understand the half of the unveiling, what about the rest? But if they understand that the unveil, the rest, is to be at the half of the half of the time, when you enter into the path of the direct path, and then the light is developing in you. And you don't need anybody to unveil for you. When you put your eyes and read spiritually, the things are coming easily. Because the light, which is Christ, is unveiling that for you. Isn't that better? Or is it better to read a book that you don't understand and to read the rest and you will understand too? Remain ignorant. You see, you have to awake. That's the path. And that's why this is a, what you see here. Kronos. Is the end. That's the end of the lecture. Do you have questions? Do you have time still? <laughs> so, um, in order to in order to, to conquer Saturn, you first have, you, uh, which means to conquer death, to conquer time, you first have to be swallowed by Saturn. Mm -hmm. Brother, how is it that Zeus conquered Saturn without being swallowed by Saturn? Well, the stone is given unto him instead of Jupiter, right? But he was the son already of him, right? And that means that uh, you have to swallow the stone in order to become uh, a very superior god. To swallow the stone is to work with your sexual forces. Stone of Yesod, remember? Yeah. And that's a mystery. I mean, everything that you read in mythology has a mystery that you have to know how to interpret. Right? It's not that literally Saturn was swallowed in a big rock. Of course not. <laughs> you know? Because in order for Saturn to swallow the stone, you have to transmute the sexual force of your stone, of your stones, and then go up to the brain, to the Holy Spirit. And he swallowed it. And he said, oh, this, is, this, this knows what he's doing. All right? But of course, uh, that's a mystery. That we have to study it. Yeah? So you, you spoke about Orpheus and going down to Hades to retrieve his wife. Is that the, is the symbol of his wife or soul in Hades, is that the same as yeah, exactly like in Popol Vuh, the same mystery. The, the daughter of uh, Bukov, Unapuich Balanke, right? Ish Balanke. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the, that soul or that uh, daughter symbolizes the soul. Within each one of us, our soul is trapped in hell. What hell? The hell that we created inside of us. That soul needs to be liberated, needs to be free. And for that, we have to kill all the unloyal ones, the hiddens. And that's precisely something within. It's not outside. The enemies are not outside. They are within you. If you conquer that, if you know how to interpret the, the doctrine or the sacred books, do you, you understand then the fights of the Popol Vuh, the fights that you find in the Bible and in mythology and the Quran? They always said, kill the unloyal ones, the unbelievers. But they are not outside of us, they are inside. In order to develop what we had to develop and to uh, rescue the soul, because our soul is trapped within seven demons lust, anger, pride. Vanity, 
laziness, gluttony, envy. Yeah, of course. The head, you just see the head there. By saying the head, that the head is in relation with the Holy Trinity, the three primary forces in the tree of good and evil. Because that tree, or that head, spits and impregnates the, the girl. That spitting, of course, is a symbol of sacred saliva, or sacred ointment that rises from the sex to your throat through alchemy. So, yeah? Is that to say that there's something sacred about somebody who has reached that stage in their own saliva? Does the saliva become changed in some way? Oh, well, when, when somebody reaches the higher level of initiation, his saliva heals. You see, in the Bible is written that when Jesus was mixing his saliva with the mud of the earth, he was smothering in the eyes of this blind man, and the blind man was seen after that. But that's the power. Now that's, of course, al alchemical statement. But uh, sometimes masters can do that. Yeah. Their saliva, because it's their very chase, has power, and they can heal you physically. Yeah. But that uh, is not that important. No. You know, I don't face too much importance to the healing of the physical body, I mean, in relation with the Bible and all of that. Because at the end, all those people that were healed died. So what is the point? Right? If we do that psychologically and we physically die, we don't lose that. The, the transformation of that, uh, of the Lord Christ within you, is something esoteric. You develop that, of course. You triumph. The don't read uh, physically because people are always so identified with, oh, I want this initiative to do a miracle physical, physical miracle on, on me. So what? You get old and you will die. So what's the point? Do it in your consciousness, in your soul. Then you will see the benefits. That's why you have to read the Bible alchemically, esoterically, in order to understand why we are now celebrating. The Saturnalia, we are in Capricorn, house of Saturn. We are in Saturday, the day of Saturn. So, he invites us always to die, psychologically. The law of death. The stigmata, that's a, a process of the half of the time. You see? Time, times, and the half of the time. The stigmata appears at the half of the time. There are many people that have the stigmata there, and they appear in TV or in the internet, because somehow they have uh, wounds in their hands and feet, and also in their side, right? But that appears there for a certain reason. But the real stigmata is in the third year of the eight years of the half of the time. When the initiate has to make those stigmata there. And for that, the initiate at that time, which is the half of the time, he has to perform or she has to perform the sexual act without desire. You say, how is she or he going to perform the sexual act without desire? Don't worry. You are not in that level yet. You have desire. And in order to perform the sexual act, you need desire. But initiates at that level, no desire at all. They perform the sexual act in a very, uh, how you call, static manner. In ecstasy. They are united, but in rapture. They don't even move. Can you do that? No. So don't talk about it. <laughs> there is another question. There. Yeah? Um, a, lot of it, a lot of it has been written about Saturnalia in a negative way. It talks about, um, like on the internet, you look, you look up a 
of Saturnalia, you hear about orgies and orgiastic rites and paganism and that kind of drunken festival and things like that. So is there a duality or degeneration related to them? Unfortunately, for the sublime to the ridiculous, it's only one step. <laughs> and this is axiomatic. Of course, like Saturday today, it's a holiday. We respect, it's Shabbat, the holiday, when you know the mysteries. But also you find the witches Sabbath, where they perform bacchanalia, and they uh, perform rituals which are related with lust, right? And, and, and they, of course, they have the rituals too, but they're completely opposite. And they are in the internet, in many parts of the world now, people that associate the Saturnalia with degeneration, because they are degenerate. Is where you, you associate things with what you have within. If you are not an initiate, how are you going to perform those, like for instance, Christmas? Christmas is a holy Saturnalia celebration that all Christians celebrate. But if you go house to house, what do you find those Christians doing? They are drunk, very drunk, and sometimes smoking marijuana and celebrating Christmas. What's that? This is not Christmas. This is the opposite. This is a, a, a demonic Saturnalia. So unfortunately, uh, all festivities or meodim had been transformed because we are demons into demonic things. Now that we are tired of these demonic celebrations, let us go on to the other extreme, to the sublime, and celebrate that and study what is that in relation with the positive aspect. Because about the negative, we have a lot, and we are tired of it. We go outside there on Friday night, Saturday, people are celebrating. But you know what they are celebrating. It's not holy. So we had to cause them to do that. And we had to also respect sometimes people do it because they don't know. But now you know. And if you do it, it's your business. But you don't have excuses. When Saturn comes, when the seventh seal comes, it says, but you know, you knew it. You hear the lecture, and you cut your head <laughs> with the scythe. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that the, uh, the the second mountain was the uh, uh, to work with the enneagram in the, the, the world of the Etzira. Different times. Yes, the different times. Um, is uh, do you do you work with the, are there other stages of the path where you work with those those spheres in uh, the other three worlds? No, no, there is only a work of the Enneagram in the second mountain, in the world of Yetziah. This is the only Enneagram that is there. So why does it because Enea, Eneas, means nine. Yeah. From that word comes the, even the number Enneagram, nine. Okay. And he, Eneas, descends to hell, mm -hmm. right? Like Orpheus. Yes. So the Enneagram is the, the descent into hell, into your own hell, into your own subconsciousness, in order to clean it, yes. to purify it. That's the Enneagram. Of course, in this day and age, you find books written about the Enneagram and people that enjoy there doing some practices with certain things, and they think that they are practicing the Enneagram. But that is very subjective. It's not uh, initiatically. Sometimes maybe, maybe it's good, but uh, we are not concerned about that. So the follow-up to that is that why does that only happen in the world of Yetzirah? Like why is it specific to Yetzirah? Because it's in relation with times. First, you, you perform time, and then times, because the world of Yetzirah are different times, you know, different worlds. The moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Those are the nine levels of the Enneagram. You have to enter in every heaven, consciously. Not theoretically, or oh, I imagine something, or no, you have to experience there, as we are talking here. That's the Enneagram. It's at different times, right? Before reaching, of course, resurrection, which is in relation with Saturn, because Saturn has to swallow you. If 
you reach times. But Saturn uh, makes his fist with you, if you reach that level, in the last year. That's the last thing. Because Saturn doesn't need filthy things. If he sees that you still are filthy or something negative, inhuman within you, he says, sorry, I won't swallow you. Keep meditating and eliminate that. And when you are really like a baby, you see, like a child, purify like a seraphim. And then I say, Saturn says, oh, I will swallow this seraphim. And then you become a feathered serpent. A great initiate. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to solve. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit has he that works in that wherein he labors? I have seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice, and to do good in his life. And also, that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is a gift of God. I know that whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God does it that men should fear before him. That which has been is now, and that which is to be has already been, and God requires that which is past. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that weakness was there, and the place of righteousness that iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Though a sinner commits crimes a hundred times and lives long, yet surely I know that it will be better with those who fear God who are reverent before him. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. 
All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.